stories. You who are on this webinar do a similar but different form of storytelling. We have an impressive group of storytellers tuning in. We thank all the news directors, assignment editors, journalists, and reporters for joining us today. It is better than anyone that you have your fingers on the pulse of this city and state. So you more than anyone have a sense of how fragile our patient is. And it is because of this fragility, it is just for that reason that we've called in not one, but two doctors to offer a holistic treatment for our patient. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Slutkin, the founder, president, and CEO of Cure Violence Global. Gary Slutkin is a physician and epidemiologist who has led efforts to combat epidemics of tuberculosis, cholera, and AIDS in over 25 countries around the globe. More recently, he's been helping advise governments on dealing with COVID-19. And more importantly for today's webinar, Dr. Slutkin is also known for innovating the epidemic control approach for dealing with violence in societies. He is credited with having re fully revealed the scientific and practical links for seeing and treating violence more as a standard health epidemic. Cure Violence Global specializes in violence prevention in conflict situations. It stops the spread of violence by using methods and strategies associated with disease control. Since its foundation in the year 2000, Cure Violence has achieved 40 to 70% drops in violence in conflict zones, and in some cases up to 100% using these methods. Dr. Ed McGuire is a professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Dr. McGuire is a criminologist who specializes in the study of policing and violence. He is the founder and director of ASU's Public Safety Innovation Lab. The Public Safety Innovation Lab serves as a hub for research, technical assistance, and training on many key public safety challenges facing the nation and world today. Relying on systematic research and evaluation, the lab seeks to inform debate about reimagining public safety the lab's work focuses on a variety of issues, including civil disturbances, pandemic response, and violence prevention. So we have two distinguished doctors who come at this malady we face in very different manners. Some housekeeping notes, the session's being recorded. Uh, it is also on the record. If you have any concerns with this, please let us know directly. We invite you to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. We will have a separate Q&A section for each speaker. Allison Frank of Cure Violence Global, and I will be curating the questions for our panelists. Let's welcome Dr. Gary Slotkin of Cure Violence Global to share his insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I want to make sure I can get this. Yes, I can. I'm sharing the screen straight up. And uh, I very much appreciate being with all of you. This is obviously an extremely important uh, topic. And I'm, uh, I'm with today with uh, Charlie Ransford, and Cassie Pascal, um, who work with us at Pure Violence. And I'm very happy to be with Ed McGuire, who we've worked um, together before on election-related violence and protest-related violence. So um, what we're going to do today is talk about um, some of the media-related matters having to do with understanding our um, situation and how the media can make things uh, better or not better. I'm quite sure that uh, most of the people here, if not everyone, has been thinking about this, has probably um, been trained, probably trained others. Um, but we're going to give you our point of view and our understanding of it in terms of its relationship to violence itself and things that relate to violence. For example, political division, for example, types of speech, um, emotion, incitement to violence, and so on. I want to just start by um, just re-emphasizing who we are. We're a global public health, uh, nonpartisan, um, neutral, um, non-governmental organization that works with communities and cities and countries to stop violence. Um, it's an epidemic control approach, as Paul pointed out, um, violence and all of the things I just mentioned all re work as epidemics. That is to say, they're contagious. Um, there are over 20 years of working in this field of violence. I, I worked at World Health before and other matters. We're just basically applying the World Health approach to violence. There have been uh, 20 studies and eight independent evaluations of approaching violence and these other um, steps toward violence in this way that show 
um, very strong reductions. In other words, this is actually a revolutionary approach and it pulls us out of morality into science and the stopping of uh, the epidemic process of violence. And 40 to 70% drops are usual in lethal events. Um, these are, this is the field in which we work. And in other words, we've been working in many different types of violence, election, um, cartel, conflict, community, um, prison, and so on. So let me give you an outline or a summary of what we're going to um, talk about in my uh, time period here. And Cassie's going to talk about safety. First, of course, you realize you're educators, but frequently I, um, I talk with journalists who are trying to cover what we're doing. And I um, will try to remind us all the amazing role, the most, almost unique role that journalists have as educators. In fact, when I was at World Health, the global, at the Global Program on AIDS, the, the director went to the media, um, this was in the late 80s, and said, I, um, I, I, want, I, I want you to know about what we're doing. I know what you're doing. We're gonna cover you. We're gonna cover the global program. He said, no, that isn't what I'm talking about. I need your help. But John Mann was saying, I, we need your help. We have a very serious global problem and people are misunderstanding the problem and they're misunderstanding the people. And I need your help as educators. And that's the frame in which the reason why I think it's so important for me and, and Ed and others to be talking to you. So the second main thing is to understand contagion and to have it in your mind when reporting, when educating. And we need to educate even on contagion. And of course, to be sure that we're not making it worse, which is difficult. It's a difficult line which of course includes considering the, the tone and the emotion. We're gonna go deeper into all of this and to describe the context and the history and, and the situation today. Now, I realize that there's a particular protest that we're discussing today, and we'll come to that in a discussion. But what I'm trying to do is to provide a principles in a context of which local leaders can comment, condemn, or, um, discuss and educate. So just as, a, as some of the most important parts of the history of the situation of the United States now, as well as um, some of the things that are going on is of course Europe historically, in which there were catastrophic events, which many of you know about, but let's just remember that many of our listeners are young and um, don't know the history don't know the extent of the, um, the violence, that uh, 70 million or so people were killed in the, as a result of the development of an authoritarian regime, which had to be defeated at the loss of all of that life, um, including um, the, uh, the genocide of Jewish people and the genocide of other peoples, totally to the extent of 11 million people by something that crept up, that wasn't expected. And that there was a betrayal that preceded this in the minds of the population. They thought that something was stolen, that something was stolen from the, the in this case, the German people, that the war of World War I was stolen and that grievance was not lost. It did not disappear. It in fact grew and it was played upon. And that US history is relevant to this because that particular regime was in fact, not just um, aware of US history, but actually looked to US history in terms of um, the US interaction with the Native American population and its genocide in a positive way and looked at Jim Crow laws as even being copied. So US history is relevant and currently um, authoritarian regimes are in the rise. More people are under authoritarian rule now than um, democratic rule. 
and there are risks within this country um, that are very serious. So what we're going to do is just spend a, a few minutes on the current U U.S. situation and to try to really understand contagion and hate speech and incitement, then go specifically to media role, and then um, your safety, and then the this or any other protests that might be coming up. So let's start with um, the current U.S. situation. Um, the political situation in this uh, country it is not just four or five years old. Um, I could show you graphs of it, many, many different things that show that it's been growing invisibly since the 70s. This is one that shows rage killings um, going up since the 70s. Inequality has been increasing since the 70s. Wages have been going down since the 70s. Um, the average health of an American has been going down since the 70s. So um, there's been an invisible, like all epidemics like COVID, underdwelling of, um, of division and of political fragility. And this is showing up now in uh, militias um, showing up armed more and more in the context of demonstrations than they did even um, a year ago. And um, 2020 is not something that's disappeared, but 2021 um, expects to show many, many other possible flashpoints, um, including immigration, COVID uh, continues to be divisory, divisory, more police shootings, anniversaries, white grievances, and gun rights are all expected to cause more flashpoints. And we have to figure out how to understand this. The way to understand this is through divisions, understanding division and understanding contagion. So this re there are two main risks, violence and um, changes in the government government structures towards more authoritarian. So us and them, you know, we're right, they're wrong. It's insoluble, almost insoluble. And there, we, there's a whole nother uh, training or sets of training around what to do and what not to do about that, but it's not solved, it's made worse by argument because people are actually defending something that in their mind is a greater truth than the truth of what we usually think of as truth, which is being true to themselves or their group. However, educating may help. This is a big deep dive, um, uh, what to do about this that we won't have time for. Um, let's talk about uh, violence itself and how it's contagious. There's a science to this summarized by the Institute of Medicine. What I mean by contagious is that one event, whether it's a violent event, whether it's a speech, whether it's a motion, leads to another one of the same thing or to worse. That's all there is to contagion. It's a risk factor for itself. It produces more of itself. And it, as it turns out, seeing violent events are more likely to cause a person to do violent events if they're susceptible. And then, of course, just like COVID or any epidemic process, one leads to another, leads to another. And here is, and I'll show you that, the essence of how basically violence is transmitted. Um, the more you see it, because there's copying mechanisms and following mechanisms in the brain that were set up in the savannah for being able to, to do what other people do. And the more exposure, the more dose, the more repetition, and the more susceptible. Susceptibility here, just like COVID, the more you're exposed and the susceptibility is just different. That was a respiratory exposure, this is a visual exposure. And then the susceptibility of COVID is older. Here, susceptibility is grievance or a need to belong or attention. These are all things that we can, this is a harder thing to deal with, 
but exposure we can try and reduce. The copying and the following. And then of course it doesn't just stop here, but it builds and so on. There are ways to prevent this. And this is what cure violence does. This is one example. Essentially what's done is stopping events, detecting and interrupting events and preventing spread. Now we're thinking about the media, it's more likely that the, um, it's the prevention of spread and the changing of norms that, um, sorry, there you go, that the media can do. How prevent spread? Not overdo the showing, the repetition, the emotion, and giving a different expectation and actually I'm calling out things that can be called out for what they are, which is why I'm going now into definitions. Now, probably most of you know these definitions, but probably many of your listeners or readers don't. And um, so hate speech, of course, in the context of a crime doesn't mean hate. Now, these are things that a media can educate your readership, your audience about. It doesn't mean hate it mean, in the context of crime. It means that that crime was done in the context of a bias. Doesn't mean hate. Doesn't mean rage or anger. It's a misname. More importantly, what about hate speech, which we've seen so much of? Um, and is all over the internet. It needs to be called out. What is hate speech? It's hate that uses language against another group, that attacks or uses language against, and that expresses hate as an usual way of thinking or encourages violence against another group. This is hate speech. It's very simple what it is, and it needs to be called out. This was hate speech what this person said was hate speech. You don't have to defame the person, but the speech can be called out as hate speech, which should try to say that's something that we shouldn't be doing for that person. What is a hate group? There's definitions that can be um, put forward about any group or just as, that is when their goals and activities are against other people. This is ADL's definition. This is um, Southern Poli Policy Law. It's when they have official statements, when they themselves are saying they have beliefs or practices against the entire class of people. Another, it doesn't have to be criminal. Same thing with speech. Now, what's the relevance of that? I'm gonna skip these definitions of extremism and terrorism. I don't like either of these words. They're based a little bit on whether something is inspired by foreign or not. But what's the relevance of all of this? It has to do with what is violence. And violence isn't just, this is the World Health Organization definition of violence. It isn't just whether there's injury or death. Something that freaks out, something that causes psychological harm, something that causes deprivation. And it doesn't actually have to be the physical use of force or power, threat alone, threat against a person, group, or community, such as hate, hate speech, I would consider a threat if it is causing psychological harm to a population. It's a very important definition. Believe me, it took years and um, all of the countries of the world to agree to this particular definition. So I'm, I'm, I'm switching a little bit into the realm of how to think about covering something that self-declares itself as Nazism or as something related to um, that. And that there's two problems here that are conflicting. One is what we're talking about is not trying to cause a contagious process. But the other, which is, and many of you know this, that a lot of the thinking was that there was a, there weren't enough journalists with enough credibility telling what was really happening. 
this is a this is a book that this is not a 1933 book. This is a book called Berlin 1933, where it, it, in retrospect, there was not enough open conversation of the, what was happening, what was creeping up, like COVID, in the context of the development of, of what became very serious change in government. There was a, um, a problem to the whole world. And there's many different things now that are showing that um, this type of propaganda is getting worse. So um, just at this point in this, to talk about the country is in a crisis of division. It has to do with increasing violence that is happening in many forms now. Community violence, mass shootings, um, uh, armed groups at protests, online, and authoritarianism is going up around the world. And never has the US been so close and um, with the threat still there. So let's come now, having gone through this basic, in a way, trying to understand and maybe convey in the right way, whatever that is, if we can discuss um, some of the things, again, to go back to media. So these are some general principles. Perhaps start with the frame. What is the frame of a particular protest instead of just the event? Now there is in some uh, times the frame is that there are, there's a lot of protests occurring in the country having to do with this particular um, grievance. Another could be, you know, the, 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 the country situation is one in which um, there is a lot of, um, more hate groups showing up than there used to be. There, it might be that um, you know, the, the situation of the election and the event of January 6th, the insurrection of January 6th is, is not over, that that is still spilling into 2021. It could be that the frame is the global situation. The second principle, so to start with something than just going to the event itself. So the event gets placed in a context. And then to, um, and we'll spend more time on this in the discussion and otherwise, to stay away from certain words and emotions and anything that could, we think, uh, um, cause more recruitment. Because all of the things, the words that some group may use, if you repeat them, we give them more um, stature, more of platform, and so on. So what makes it worse? Repetition makes it worse. And this is of any phrase, any words. Um, repetition can make anything better, too. Repetition is, is highly relevant for both positive communication and for propaganda. It fits in your brain. Even if you're repeating that something is a lie, it of course, it itself is being repeated. Um, the way that you express yourself, this is really hard in reporting because I know emotion leads. Images stick. Um, you've all heard, we all know that this is um, a negative to talk about the individual or the group by name. And we could talk about a group that you know, calls itself or a group that you know, represents this. Uh, I'll tell you when, when in our organization, when we talk about things that people call gangs, let me just say, we don't use the word gangs, we use groups. And we call them group A and group B. We don't actually refer to them by name, by their name. In our, even our, in our individual discussions, we don't call them names. You just said this group, group A, group B. Keep in your mind the contagion. Make sure that we're not normalizing it, either the hate speech, whatever it is that leads into this realm of contagion. Do something about speaking out against it, saying this isn't normal. This isn't what we need. This is not what we expect. This is not this country. These are denormalizing phrases. So you leave the audience 
if you're going to editorialize at all, but um, that with the a different expectation of what is normal. Violence is not normal. It is not a universal condition. It's a it's a condition of copying. The data, the science shows that violence is something that is copied. It's following. It's not normal. It's many and most societies in most communities are living without violence. It shows up when it begins with one event and then there's more events. This is the minimizing the platforms. Don't speculate about what might happen um, because that leads to an expectation. And then again, the language that we choose to use. Avoid scary words and avoid dehumanizing words. All right, so um, I wanna get through a few more things to make sure we have time. Um, here's language, we've said that. Um, we really need to think through using violent imagery or videos. Um, what's the merit of it, showing it? What's the harm? You know, what are we really doing? All right. Um, why do we like some protests in or rallies and not? Is it really because of our side? So if you think about any, are they um, arguing for themselves, for their own rights? Or are they infringing on others? And are they nonviolent or violent? Well, as it turns out, some this could be switched because some people think that others are infringing on them and that they're fighting for themselves. So we're not so sure here always, although you may feel sure, I may as well. This is where we should really draw the line for sure. This is the most dangerous. But in all of this, where you're really infringing on others in violence, and remember this larger definition, this actually, this is, I did not make up this, the World Health Organization definition of violence includes threat and includes psychological damage to others. All right, so here we're summarizing. Keep it contagion in your mind. Keep the, um, educated on the context. Get local leaders' comments, especially if you can end with anything condemning anything that you think makes sense because it fits a definition of violence. And then we have the history. And um, Cassie, I'm gonna give it to you and I'll, I'll carry on with the slides. Okay, so I will just briefly touch on safety and best practices, particularly for journalists, both on the ground and online. Uh, so, of course, your safety comes first. So when we talk about being on the ground, I think one of the best things is to just be aware of your surroundings at any demonstration. Be mindful of if demonstrators are recording you, if they are taking photos of you. Be mindful of those that may be following you. Sometimes journalists can become targets of participants at certain events. So to be mindful of that and to have exit plans in place, because I think we would mostly recommend not to engage if something is becoming, is escalating and to walk away. Another thing that is always good to do is to introduce yourself to police that may be at these demonstrations, to make yourself known and to not stand in the way between the police and demonstrators. So that's just a brief on on the ground, but we do wanna to touch a little bit on your digital safety as well. As we've moved into the, to the digital sphere, we have seen that different groups have been known to breach safety, particularly of journalists and politicians. So just some basics is to make sure your settings are secure and private and to be aware of what's being said about you online. So especially if you've written an article that may or may not be received well by a particular person or a particular group, to look at the online chatter and also check alternative platforms because you never know if they might be intending to target you. 
So on this targeting, I want to talk on doxing. So for those that don't know what doxing is, it's essentially a process by which an individual or a group is trying to gather your personal identifiable information. So the common practices are to look for public records. So whether that's your property records, wedding announcements, public forums, or it's your social media. They can also even get this even easier using these data broker sites, which essentially collect all of your public and commercial records and sell them to other companies. But doxers can now purchase this too. So for as little as a dollar, they can get your address or your phone number. And below is just kind of an image of a message board showing how that can happen in real time, say on Telegram or Parler. And so it can be really dangerous. So we just want to touch a little bit on how to protect yourself from doxing. Some basics that I think everyone can do, whether or not you may have a potential threat of being doxed or not, is just changing the privacy settings on your social media to ensure that there's a barrier between your personal information and your work life. Another thing I think everyone can do is changing your passwords and making sure there is two-factor authentication on everything to ensure there's another barrier to getting access to your email or your bank accounts. Now, something that you may not always do, but I think if there is a potential threat of being doxxed is to opt out of these data broker sites because that is why it's so easy to get access to all of your public information. So there are hundreds of them. So I'll send a link after this um, presentation of the list of all of them. So you can either do it manually, or if there is a real threat, you can also pay certain pardon, organizations like Delete Me or Privacy Doc, and they'll actually just take it all off for you within a week. And if you ever happen to actually have been doxxed, which can be really scary, but there are resources you can go to like equalitylabs.org and they will help you take down any public information that has been leaked about you online to ensure that your privacy is restored. So this was just some basics on kind of protecting yourself on the ground and online. So maybe I'll just turn it back to Gary for closing statements before Q&A. Um, I don't have any closing statements. I think we could go right to questions or um, however, Paul, however else you want to go on. Well, we'll open this up for a question and answer for Gary on uh, his presentation and if any of the um, journalists on the call have any questions for him. You can use the question answer chat function. Well, if we don't have any questions, then we'll turn it over to Ed. Oh, here we do have some questions, Allison. Uh... Yeah. So. Um... This weekend, some of the right wing groups are hoping to be covered favorably by news outlets. How do the journalists prevent that? And is it biased to prevent that? Well, um, I think you will figure that out. For I think that anyone who's doing stuff most want to either get attention or be covered covered favorably or not favorably. Um, and to many are, are both good um, because not favorably to some people becomes favorably to other people. So, you know, these, you have to see what it is that will occur. And, um, you know, we can pre-think this um, but what, what I understand of what is occurring or expected to occur there is um, a group to which you, you may or may not know as much as you want to know about what their essential doctrine is. And um, you know, how much coverage you give them is, is really one matter for you to consider within these principles, whether it's, and then um, what is 
uh, favorable coverage of um, if a group is behaving well, but stands for principles that are not. So, you know, it, it, I don't feel that I, we can do much more at this moment than to have people have all of us understand what is going on. And um, uh, educate the public as to what this what this is. If you think it rises to a level of relevance. So you know this is it, it's it's this point of you you can't know what to do, but what you can know is what not to do. And you go from how you understand it. And, um, I'm happy to have a discussion about this. You know, what if, what if? But I also am really sensitive to the time of other questions too. But if you know, if a group has a a, a stated intentional connection to something that has a particular history. Um, I don't know that everybody knows, all the listeners know what that history is and how seriously horrible it, it is, if that connection is as clear as it may be. So th these are just my first thoughts on this in um, being uh, not in your local situation, but even been told a little bit about um, what is expected. And also not knowing very much of the detail of a group or groups that might or might not show up and what they're intending to do. But it, it's all about being thoughtful in advance, but also at the time, ensuring you're not making wor things worse. Um, and um, putting it in a context. I hope that's slightly helpful. Um, it, it can't be fully scripted. I think I'll stop with that to be sure we can move on to other things. Thanks, Gary. Um, we have two more questions. So when we look at the group that's planning to organize this weekend, uh, what do you make of this group and how would you characterize them to educate viewers? And actually another question came in, so we have three more questions. The, so I have not done research on this group. So that would be a, a, a different um, uh, thing. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to people about that, um, but I haven't done um, research on any particular group. Um, and then another question. So the group that is coming to Phoenix is looking for violence, it seems. Uh, is it better to have a pre-story up to warn people which might bring counter protesters or do a day of story? So what, what has, um, Ellie, tell me again how that started. What was the first sentence there? So it seems that the group that's coming to Phoenix is looking for violence. So does it make sense to do a pre-story before to warn people or to do a day of story once events have, are happening? Um, my preference just based on the principles that we've been talking about is not to do anything pre. First off, we don't know what anybody really wants unless they've said it. If someone said that they think so, I don't know if that's um, the case. And I think a pre-story um, would, you probably know how I'm gonna finish this, it may very likely you know, set up an expectation and therefore be part of the cause. And so, you know, if we just keep it in our mind that we're also wanting there to not be violence and we're not wa and we're wanting to not be part of whatever might um, make it worse, then um, I, I probably wouldn't be inclined to do a, a pre-story of, you know, we're, we're anticipating violence. Now, I think, you know, 
um, other groups around. I mean, there's just so many factors to this that Ed will get into, I, I think, as to you know what it can be done on the ground other than the media to try to ensure or um, prevent violence. You know, talking to other groups to not um, be interacting with that, at least not to get provoked educating other groups to not be incited and um, and also you know the preparation of law enforcement in their, in their role so that they also are not making things worse which is really what Ed will be talking about I'm gonna and, to do, and to make it better. I'm going to piggyback on the question about the groups. Um, we are glad to help provide resources on the group that is coming today. Um, I mean coming this weekend excuse me. Uh, we have lots of background we can provide from different sources on on the, the group that is coming so please reach out to me if you need some more additional background on that but I'm, I'm glad to make that available you know what are there you know if you think that they might be a um one thing i mean look at what are their written principles on their website what have they done before if you're focused on them and then, you know, how important is it? How important is this event? Um, so is there a resource available that you would point people to that they should use for reporting on stories like this for proper terminology? There isn't one. I mean, we have, I think the, um, the Department of Homeland Security has its definitions having to do ex extremism and terrorism and um, things of this nature. The um, Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center have um, definitions related to hate groups, hate crimes. Is the Justice Department has definitions. There isn't one um, dictionary that I know of. Um, we, um, if we find one, we might have to make one um, this is really important question. It's a really important area. Um, so that some words are not overused. I mean, the, the, I like the Oxford Dictionary or, you know, Merriam Webster for, to me, what I'm really concerned about is, um, violence and inciting of violence in groups that might do that. And much of the rest is name calling. Of course, some of it is legal. Some of it is for you know, classifications that organizations may make or do. But for me, much of this is, 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 is name calling. In fact, I mean, if we call something right or left, what does that mean? Extreme right, what does that mean? Right wing extreme, what does that mean? They very much think that there shouldn't be taxes. That they really hate abortion. What does really right, extreme right wing mean? It's, I don't think it's helpful. So I, I understand it, but, um, it's not the way that the health people would be categorizing what's going on. It would be in terms of behavior. It would be, you know, was, is there, is there, you know, risky sexual behavior? Is there risky hand washing behavior? Is there risky non mask wearing behavior? Is there risky violent behavior? Is the group you know, in inciting violence, causing violence to be more likely. And then everything else is political division, but there's always groups. And there's this country in this country, there's this religion in this religion, there's this so-called race in this race. The rest is just division, which we understand. But are they, have your beliefs, have your religion, have your race, but don't do, don't do violence and don't motivate it. That's the way we in health and public health see this. These are different groups. They're like gangs. 
but that word is also very inflammatory. So we use the word groups, you have big groups and with splinters to them. That's the way we see this. And we I think have we should give, I think we should give Ed some time here. The, he knows so much about th this field and what's going on on the ground locally as well, especially given the time. We have one more question. And I want to hear what Ed has to say as well. Gary, we're just going to do one more question before we move on. Um, do you have any advice on how to give proper context on a group's history without giving them a platform or propaganda? Well, um, it, factual, on a unemotional, you know, objective, pretend like you are looking at this as a, a reporter, educator, you know, extremely matter of fact. You know, this group is identified with this other group that has a history of that, if it's matter of fact and factual. And in their past, they have done this, um, they protest this frequently, and um, it's not clear what they're saying, or it they are they're protesting because of what. I mean, that is such an important question to me. What are why are are is it a protest? Is it a rally? Was it done? What is it that they're doing? I would not call it anything that it isn't. And let's say, what are they saying? You know, I mean, for there are some groups who you can imagine who are saying quite clearly what they are concerned about. And there are others you don't know why they're showing up. What is it that they're saying? A lot of people need to be listened to. They may have a grievance. What is it? And then you could even discuss um, what that is, what is real about it, what is valid about it, what isn't, and so on. But I, I don't know what this group, I don't know if anyone on the call even knows what it is that they are saying is the reason why they're coming out to do what? So on that point, we can- we, we can provide more of the resources on that. Um, we're in touch with the Anti-Defamation League, the Western State Center. Uh, so if any of the, the journalists on this need some more resources on the NSM who's coming, we can help provide that. But I wanted to thank Dr. Gary Slutkin for his presentation this morning. And we are going to, um, we're going to transition to Professor Ed McGuire. So thank you, Gary. And uh, we will have Ed take over from here. And... Ed, if you are there, thank you, Gary, for your work. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. And thank you, Gary. Um, OK, so uh, I'm the director of the Public Safety Innovation Lab, or the PSI Lab, at uh, Arizona State University. And you know, we focus um, primarily, most of our work is related to policing and violence, and in particular, violence uh, prevention, violence reduction. And so this, this theme of, of preventing or minimizing violence is, is what I'm going to focus on today very briefly. Um, so I want to start off just by talking about how to think about or conceptualize violence during rival protests. And I'm using the term rival protests to refer to any protest event where you have um, groups who are protesting against one another. Um, and so during rival protests, one, way, one of the ways to think about this is that there are at least three groups. Um, there's the protesters, or in this case, the, the NSM rally attendees. There's the counter protesters who are uh, almost certain to show up. And then there's, there's the police. And at, at, when we think about the violence pre, uh, prevention or violence reduction at these events, it's helpful to think about the, the, the different dyads involved. So you can have violence as potentially occurring between any of the three dyads that are expected to, to be at this event. So the protesters versus the counter protesters is the most obvious one. That's the one we saw in Charlottesville. 
you have protesters versus police uh, and you have counter protesters versus police. And we've seen a lot of these kinds of dynamics take place recently in, in Portland. We've seen some of these dynamics take place in Washington, DC. Um, and these are the things that concern me about the, the rally that's coming up here shortly in Phoenix. One of the issues that, that, that's really concerning right now is that in the current climate, there's really a significant sense of grievance among all three of these groups, um, including the protesters that are both left-leaning and right-leaning. Um, the right-leaning protesters are historically aggrieved against the left, that's just a given. Um, however, many of them are also now aggrieved against the police. We've started to see right-leaning protesters and hate groups in Portland, Oregon, for instance, and in Salem, Oregon, and certainly in Washington, D.C., um, start to uh, uh, engage in violence against the police. Historically, I think they felt like they had some sort of tacit approval uh, or at least some sense that they were on the same side as the police. And we're starting to see that fray lately. Um, and so, you know, there's always the possibility of right-leaning protesters, um, not only clashing with left-leaning protesters, but also clashing with the police. And protesters who are left-leaning are, again, historically aggrieved against right-leaning protesters, but they're also historically aggrieved against the police. And one of the concerns right now is the timing, because these tensions right now are really at a fever pitch with the Derek Chauvin trial, the death of Dante Wright recently. Um, and one factor to keep in mind here in terms of context is that Dion Johnson was shot and killed about uh, a little less than 11 months ago by DPS, uh, Arizona DPS, on the same day that George Floyd was killed last May. And the DPS is going to be the principal agency responsible for policing the NSM rally. Um, and so this, this is most certainly going, these issues are certainly going to be on the minds of the counter protesters, the left leaning protesters at the rally. So you've got lots of different sort of dyads, um, where, or at least three different dyads here, depending on how many groups show up, where, where violence is, is, is possible. Um, and the, uh, the, you know, the, the sense of grievance that all three groups are feeling right now, I think is, is really high. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece of context to keep in mind about how violence may occur at this event, any one of those dyads or, or potentially multiple dyads. So one of the things we specialize in at the PSI lab is um, the policing of, of crowd events. Um, and so some things to keep in mind here um, about how police can prevent or minimize violence at this event. Or, or similar events is just, first of all, encouraging counter protesters to stay away um, and working with community partners to spread that message as effectively as possible. Um, there's just, you know, a, a key way to prevent violence is to minimize the number of counter pr protesters who show up. Ideally, from a violence prevention standpoint, the ideal number of counter protesters would be zero. That's unlikely to happen, but certainly minimizing the number of counter protesters, I think, is, is important. And that's not to say that, that, you know, people's voices need to be taken away. They should certainly say what they want to say um, and, and, and try you know, try to get their message out there, but preferably not get the message out there right there at the event where, where violence is, is, a, is a huge risk. Um, you know, another thing that police can do is to, to work with protesters to ensure that they're behaving peacefully, which means engaging in a lot of dialogue with protesters, both ahead of the event and at the event. It should be very clear to protesters and counter protesters what actions on their part will re result in the use of force, uh, the use of arrest, and what actions are permissible. And of course, police always need to be mindful of, of facilitating the First Amendment rights of whoever shows up, regardless of the content of their expression. One of the big issues that happens, and we've seen this a lot, uh, particularly over the past year, is ensuring that police don't inadvertently trigger violence by behaving in a provocative manner with either extremist groups or those who are protesting against them. Um, 
And we know that one important way of preventing violence at these events is to keep extremist groups separated. They should be within eyesight and earshot of one another because of the First Amendment, but they shouldn't be permitted to come into physical contact with one another. And that's, we should not minimize the fact that that can often be a really, really difficult job uh, and one that places police in, in danger trying to, to stand between two groups who may want to do harm to one another. Another issue that's come up really frequently uh, over the last year has been uh, the need for police to behave neutrally, um, to be extremely cautious and not showing favoritism or to even be perceived as showing favoritism to either group, uh, engaging in, in behaviors that, that show favoritism to one group over the other uh, can inadvertently trigger violence. Um, if force must be used or arrests must be made, we always encourage police to engage in precise targeting of individuals who are engaging in violent or destructive behavior and not to use forms of force that are indiscriminate. And so using stinger grenades that just shoot um, you know, pellets or other objects um, out at the crowd indiscriminately. They sort of can't control who the, you know, who, who is struck by those munitions or using tear gas. You know, these indiscriminate types of munitions and chemical agents are really not to be used uh, until we're at the point of having a full-blown riot. Up until that point, any use of, 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 of force by police should be highly discriminating, highly precise. And then finally, ensuring that there's a seamless incident command structure on site for coordinating the work of the different agencies involved. What we've seen at many different events over the years in the United States is that when multiple agencies are involved, as there will be in this event very likely, um, poor communication uh, and poor coordination uh, can result in, in, in just kind of all kinds of negative outcomes. And so ensuring that there's a single seamless incident command structure coordinating the work of these various agencies is really uh, vital. I wanna speak just for a moment about the media's role um, at these events, you know, one of the things just to, to echo something Gary said is extremist groups want to bring attention to their cause. And, and I would ask that in your reporting on this event, doing whatever you can to deny them that attention. Um, a couple of ideas to consider uh, instead of, you know, focusing a lot of attention on the group themselves is to focus on the people who are experiencing trauma because of their words and actions. I've spoken with folks in the Jewish community just in the past week who are, you know, it's, it's harmful that this group is coming here to do what it's doing. Um, and, you know, one possibility is to, uh, is to highlight um, the harms that they're causing uh, and not necessarily uh, echoing their message. And then finally, uh, to echo some of the uh, some of the what some of the previous speakers said, you know, journalists face significant threats to their safety at protests and especially, especially at rival protests. Um, and I'm actually giving a talk later this week at a New York State Sociological Association meeting on the threats facing journalists during crowd events. Um, and so just a couple of on the ground pointers um, so that 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 none of you end up becoming among the, the victims of, of violence uh, at this event is, first of all, just don't be alone. Don't be navigating the crowd alone. Uh, make sure you're, you're partnered up with somebody so that if anything were to happen, you have some, some backup, some protection, a witness, all of these different kinds of ideas in mind. Um, because of the use of, of less lethal munitions, you know, rubber bullets and pepper balls and the various types of things that police sometimes end up firing during riots and, and civil disturbances, make sure you have eye protection available. Um, there were over 400 people uh, who received eye injuries during the protests last year in Chile. Um, when police would fire um, uh, impact munitions into the crowd. Don't be among the people who get an eye injury uh, during this event. Um, wear a helmet if possible. Um, 
uh, just to protect yourself from what police refer to as air mail. Uh, so items that are being thrown uh, by whichever group uh, while you're there covering the event, it, it, it uh, could be pretty um, easy for you to receive a head injury if objects were to be thrown. So even if you have something as simple as a bicycle helmet, um, wearing a helmet at an event like this where there's a possibility of violence would be useful uh, for protecting your own skull. Um, and then finally, just wearing very clear identifiers indicating that you're a journalist. Um, police are uh, have routinely used uh, force uh, against journalists over the past year in the United States, and they've also um, arrested journalists on many occasions. And so just sort of making it very clear that you're a journalist so that you don't get caught up in any kind of enforcement action is, is really possible. And then finally, my last point is just um, it's it's your First Amendment right to cover the event. Uh, it's a social responsibility to, to cover the event uh, accurately. Um, but do your best to try to stay out of the way of any uh, use of force or violence that starts to occur. And particularly when police start issuing orders to disperse, just making sure you're not in the way between police and whoever they're taking enforcement action against, making sure that you're off to the side to try to stay out of the way of that. A lot of journalists over the past years, past year have gotten caught up in that kind of um, violence or use of force and just do your best to stay safe at the event, please. And, and that's all I have for you. Thank you so much much folks. Well, thank you, Professor McGuire. Uh, we'll open this up to question and answer. If you have any questions, uh, please put that in the chat and we will uh, pose those to Professor McGuire. Go ahead and type them out. In the meantime, um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, can uh, Ed, can you share some of the, the discussions you've been having with uh, some of the parties involved in this current protest? just of um, your, your sense of how they're handling this? Um, it, you know, it does appear that the police are in contact with, uh, with, with the groups involved. Um, there has been a pretty significant difficulty. This is not local, this is a national phenomenon. There has been a pretty significant difficulty that US police have faced over, particularly since the death of George Floyd, in being able to uh, engage in dialogue with protesters, uh, uh, left leaning protesters, with particularly with uh, folks associated with NT for Black Lives Matter or, you know, the various kinds of social justice uh, groups that engage in, in left leaning protests. Um, there is a lot of pressure. Uh, on protesters themselves from their peers not to engage in dialogue with the police. Uh, and in particular over the past year because the protests are against the police. And this is problematic because, you know, even police who are highly committed uh, to trying to engage in dialogue with, with protest groups, um, because dialogue with protest groups reduces violence. We know that. There's decades of research on this. Uh, unfortunately, police in the U.S., even sort of really well-intentioned police, are really struggling to be able to engage in that dialogue with left-leaning protesters. Um, and so I know police have reached out, um, but are finding um, th that type of dialogue challenging, um, which is unfortunate because we know that, that it works. Um, and so, um, but I do think police, you know, have a, a good sense of what's coming, um, have an understanding of the challenges that they're facing, and, and um, we'll see what happens. We have a question for you. Uh, who did you speak with in the past week about the trauma they experienced? Are they with any organizations you can name? Uh, in the past week, I have not. Oh, so in the past week, no, I've spoken to individuals in the Jewish community, not anybody part of, not anybody who is part of an organized group. And no, not somebody I can name. I'm sorry. Okay. Do we have any other questions? If not, we are upon our hour here, um, but we remain available in a resource and we'll see if there are any more questions that come in the next minute or so. Seeing no more questions, then we're going to close this. And I just wanted to say, uh, there's no panacea for this. There's no miracle cure. And we're all amid a very challenging procedure, but if we can adapt some of the best practices that were being offered today, we can help our patient get through this. Thank you all for tuning in. As I mentioned, this program has been recorded. We can make that available. 
Um, the JCRC, we're in close contact with a diverse coalition of faith and ethnic community partners across the valley. We're all deeply concerned about the events taking place this weekend. Um, this isn't a Jewish community issue. This is an issue of all of the communities in Arizona, and we're facing this together. Uh, so we will continue to be a resource for you as we get through this. Big thanks to Cure Violence Global. Big thanks to ASU's Public Safety Innovation Lab. Thank you, Dr. Gary Slutkin. Thank you, Dr. Ed McGuire. Uh, thanks to Abby Fink for her help uh, and support. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks.